All right, let's go to Romans chapter 15. The title of today's message is Reminders to Rome and also to us. Reminders to Rome and us. Guys, I got to give like the post-service review time. I would say, Pastor Jacob, when it came to changing the tone from heavy to light, you get a 10 out of 10. Way to go, man. That was not an easy situation to put Jacob in, (laughs) to go, you know, from talking about something very, very heavy to the chili cook-off and flannel. But dude, you nailed it. So way to go. Way to go. Hey, I'm excited about what God is doing in our church. We're a church that is going somewhere. That's why we have something called CIL Forward. It's a online class. Occasionally we offer it face-to-face, but it's online to learn who we are, whether you're brand new, whether you've been here a long time and want to know more about us. It's a, a video course you can take at your own, own pace. And one of the things that we talk about is what Jacob mentioned earlier. Our mission is to know his love and to share his love. That's, that's what God's called us to do. This is really according to Matthew 28, 18 and 19, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. So we, we gather to know his love but we also share his love. And that's why what I mentioned earlier in, in the land of Israel is part of our mandate too, is to share his love with the people there. So thank you for being a great church. You don't come to a great church, you are a great church. So there's a difference there, isn't there? You don't come to church to receive an experience. You are the church. You make up the church by your participation. Pastor Mauricio, you and your team, welcome home from Honduras. Can we welcome them home, huh? Man, now now you are paid to be here, so thanks for being here, and so is Faith. But Matthew Gregory, who's running the media today, is not. He was here at at 745 this morning after getting off a plane last night. Come on. Isn't that great? Thank you, Matthew. And I'm sure there's others like that. And, uh, but the Lord, the Lord knows, the Lord knows, doesn't he? So I'm very ex- excited to teach about Romans 15 uh, because, you know, Rome was the capital of the Roman Empire. And I think about the Roman Empire often. Okay, if you're on social media, that's a, a thing, a joke, but thank you. So, yes, I think about the Roman Empire often and so should you. Rome was the most celebrated city in the world. In the time of Jesus, in the time when the New Testament was written, all of the spoils of the, Ro- of the world were in Rome. And, and in fact, every known country from a Western mindset had representatives living in Rome. There were so many Jews in Rome that they, they had their own special section of the city. And that is why many, many Christians were in Rome. And hence, the book, Romans, were written to the Christians in this very, very important city. Uh, This city had lots of apartments, what we would call today, these kind of made-up dwellings, small dwellings where people were, with tight streets and lots of interaction. Here's basically what I'm saying. The city of Rome, even 2,000 years ago, had many characteristics of a city today. The the way people connected, the way people interacted, the way commerce happened, even even something like sports or the arts were present 2,000 years ago. And what happens when you're in a city and there's narrow streets and dense housing? There's lots of interaction. Lots of interaction. I was actually looking forward to October, the first week of October, fall break in Sumner County. This is a sign that I'm getting old. I was looking forward to less traffic this last week. And I've got to say, I was a little disappointed. Because here at Indian Lake, there by the streets of Indian Lake, it doesn't get any better even under fall break. And one thing we have to accept that even all these roads are we're talking about building and we're planning to build, as soon as they're built, they'll be filled up again. That's one of the the prices of being in a growing city. But I am glad our city has grown. I'm glad Nashville has grown. I'm not one who 
who wishes for the past. Uh, I, I know our church is a better church because of the transplants who have come from different parts of, of, of the country. And so I'm grateful for you. And I'm glad that our city is, is um, you know, and the many cities that are represented in this room, uh, Hendersonville, White House, Goodlesville, Gallatin, are, are part of the greater Nashville story now. I think that's exciting. I think that's good. What that means is we're going to interact more. That means there's more cultures that are blending. That, that means that there's more opportunity for us that is positive, but there's also going to be challenges for us. And so today, we're going to look at a passage of Scripture to people who were not as unlike us as we think. They were, let's put it this way, they were more like us than we think. Different cultures, different languages, all gathering in a city. Sounds a lot like Middle Tennessee right now. Different perspectives, different generations, and tight quarters. You know, you can't just move around the city quite as fast as you used to. And so there's lots of opportunities, like the I-65 interchange in White House, Lots of opportunities to lose your temper. Downtown Gallatin, lots of opportunities to lose your temper just right here. Getting out of Christ is Love Church on Sunday morning. <laughs> lots of opportunity. And yes, you could live somewhere where you never have traffic, but it's going to be boring. And it's, you're going to be lonely. And it's not going to be exciting. So all of this interaction creates friction. And then now we present to you the word of the Lord because of the word of the Lord gives so much wisdom. Uh, our, our scripture revealed through Jesus and also through Peter, Paul, John, the New Testament writers is so practical. It's so much more practical than we want to admit because when we admit how practical scripture is, then we're responsible for it. If it's like all about codes and hidden messages and all this, it's, it's, it's this distant kind of complicated thing. But if, if it's as simple as reading and applying, then we're responsible for it, right? So we're not going to get off the hook by disappearing from this world. We're going to become like Christ in this world. And we're going to do the work of well, he does the work. Let me put it that way. We are going to present ourselves to him so he does the work within us. So here we go. Romans chapter 15, starting with verse 1. Now we who are strong have an obligation to bear the weaknesses of those without strength. And not to please ourselves. Each one of us is to please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself. On the contrary, as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So my first observation, I'm going to give you three observations from the whole passage today. We haven't read the whole passage, but here's my first one from these first four verses or three verses is we're called to build up others. This is our reminder. Paul was reminding the Romans of this, and now he's reminding us of this here in the year 2023. We're called to build up others. And I just want to make this acknowledgement. It's really easy to tear someone down. I mean, it's not complicated. I know you can get popular and you can make the room laugh by tearing someone down, but so easy to do that. You can always point out the obvious, right? You can point out the obvious. You can always identify the weakness. You can always observe the flaw. No big deal. But to build, to be a builder of people, it takes intelligence, it takes intuition, it takes courage, and it takes love. But I want you to hear this. That's what we're called to do. You are not called to tear people down. You're called to build people up. You are called to make people better, to add value to people, so that when others are around you, through the words you say, and even the whole persona that you live out through Christ, they become better, they become bigger, they increase 
in their humanity and in the reflection of God. But what we often do is tear down, tear down, tear down. That's the quickest laugh. It's the quickest path to temporary popularity. And it's a way for us to mask our smallness and our insecurity and our hurts. Look at verse 2 again. Each one of us is to please his neighbor for his good to build him up. This is our call to do. Can, can, can I tell you this? Our world craves encouragement. I mean, it's just amazing that if you become an encourager, you'll find how much people crave that. They, they want that so bad. And you are someone who can dispense that through the work of Jesus in your life. Have you ever attended church with someone who got on your nerves? Let's make that a rhetorical question. I will not ask for hands. <laughs> when I think about the scripture, it says, those of you who are strong, you know, you should, you should give allowances for those who are weak. That's what the scripture said. We have an obligation to bear the weaknesses. I, I remember right here in this room, I've been here so long now, it says, like, I've got to tell stories about you guys, but I have to tell stories about people who used to go to church here. And so that's, this is such the case. In both, there, there was uh, someone who used to go to church here who said, I don't need to talk to you, pastor. I just cannot concentrate in your sermons. I can't get through them. And I'm like, well, I understand. I'm not the best preacher, all that. But it wasn't my fault. She said, on the third row, there is a couple that cannot keep their hands off each other. So I'm thinking, are they 13, 14, or 15, you know? But no, they were in their 40s. I'm like, well, you know, are they, they're here. I mean, they're, they're romantic. They're maybe, you know, following scripture. I don't know. I mean, they're just a little cuddly, man. They're cuddling here in the word of God, you know? I didn't really see the issue, but... She couldn't get past it. I mean, it was just like she couldn't. I had to like work her through it, counsel her through it. That's just one example is like there's someone, if you go to church long enough, there's going to be someone who's your brother or sister in Christ, but they just get on your nerves. And sometimes they just don't understand, right? They, they just don't understand that, that um, maybe etiquette, I don't know. I didn't have a problem with what was happening, uh, but they, they, maybe they don't understand. But I do remember this. I didn't, this story just came to mind. So back when we planted a church and we had a new Christian come to the church, and this was in 2005. And uh, one of the guys who was a new Christian back in that day, you're not going to believe what he did. He was an usher back when we had ushers. Guys, he wore shorts and sandals. And I had a, I had a board member at a board meeting, it came up, they're like, uh, I don't know if, if we, we, you know, if that's proper etiquette. And so one of the businessmen who were in our church got so mad, he said, Pastor, I'm going to wear shorts and sandals next week and usher. Put me on the ushering team because I'm going to prove to him that it doesn't matter. But it's interesting how we have these interactions and those of us who are strong spiritually ought to, ought to bear with the weaknesses of others. And we should encourage believers. We should build them up. If you need encouragement, you're like, man, I wish someone would just encourage me today. I want to challenge you to give what you need. If we give what we need, if you're like, man, this church is a very friendly church, go be friendly and start changing the culture of our church. If you say, well, you know, I wish more people here would share more scripture with each other by text. Well, it's time for you to start texting some scriptures to some people you know. You don't wait for what you need, you give what you need and you build others up. Matthew seven twelve says it this way, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. Now, that, that's a nice statement, it's known as a golden rule, even the world says this is a golden rule, but look at the power of the next phrase. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. So this, this can save you some time, okay? This is Jesus talking here. You can read the law, which is the Pentateuch, basically Genesis through Leviticus, yeah, or Deuteronomy, Genesis through the Deuteronomy, 
five tough chapters to read in the Bible. I'm telling you, it's tough. You ought to do it sometime, but it, it's, it's going to be, you're going to have to really slog through it a little bit, okay? Then you've got the prophets, like Isaiah through Malachi. There's a little more exciting stuff in that, but, but that's a little tough reading too. You should do that someday. God's going to speak to you through that. But according to Jesus, Matthew 7, 12 says, if you do to whatever, to others, whatever you would like them to do to you. Look, look at that scripture again. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law, Genesis through De- Deuteronomy, and the prophets, Isaiah through Malachi. Th- this is like living out this God-inspired life that we consider others. We build others up. We don't just look to please ourselves. The scripture already said Jesus didn't even do that. He took insults upon himself. So we, didn't, we wouldn't have to be insulted. He took the insult of sin upon him. So we wouldn't have to live with the consequences of sin or the punishment of sin. This is what God's called us to do. Thomas Jefferson said this, a candle loses nothing when it lights another candle. A candle loses nothing when it lights another candle. You know, something I've told you before, but it bears repeating, is that we purchase thoughts. We actually spend our money and we spend our time to purchase thoughts. In fact, you are spending the quantity, you're spending the, the currency, excuse me, of time right now just by listening to this message. You're, you're, you're spending time right now. You're purchasing thoughts, thoughts that I'm giving you. I want to show you from this scripture, I want to encourage you to allow scripture and the Bible to shape your thoughts. This leads to point number two today. Let Scripture form you. Let Scripture form you. We live in the information age. We have access to more information than anyone who's ever been alive in this world. And we have it from the thing you have either on your, in your hand or on your body right now. It's amazing. Because of the information age, the digital revolution, right there you carry this computer in your hand that in the 1970s would have been the envy of of major governments. You you have this computer in your hand. You have access to all, all of the information. It wasn't long ago that Christians could only learn what the pastor told them. It was just a few hundred years ago. And I would even argue even as recent as 150 years ago when, when, when reading was just starting to become common and access to the Bible was just really coming into 1800. So just not very long ago that you were dependent upon just what a leader told you. Then we, then we received the Bible and praise God, there's nothing like the Bible. And praise God for it and multiple translations and multiple interpretations. But Now, in these last 23 years, 25 years, we have access to information that was only in academia. You had to just, you had to go and be accepted to a college and to get access to certain professors or you you had to really search for a particular book in a library and wouldn't even know where to search. And now, within moments, we have all of this information. With all of this information, I'm calling you and you'll see here that that the text today calls you to Scripture, to the Bible, to the Word of God to help form your thoughts. Let's go to verse 4 of Romans 15. For whatever was written in the past, now let me just talk to you about this for a second. Remember, this was written a long time ago. So this is actually referring to the Old Testament. So whatever was written in the past, what we now call the Old Testament, was written for our instruction so that we may have hope through endurance and through encouragement from the scriptures. That's one of the reasons why so much of the Old Testament that we study is metaphor to us. We know truth is truth, right? Truth is truth. But even our New Testament writers were saying, okay, here's a story. This is how the story applies to your life today. This is how you're going to live this week. 
Now, I'm not suggesting that miracles are metaphors. No, I, I believe, let me just be clear. My mind's racing now. I'm like, oh, everybody's getting suspicious. I believe the sea split on dry land. You know, I, I believe in all of the miracles of, of Elijah and Elisha. Uh, Elisha had more recorded miracles than anyone in the Bible except Jesus himself. So I don't believe those things are metaphorical. I think they're real. The axe head floated on water. These are real things that happen. But the scripture tells us today, those and other things, negative things, are meant for our encouragement and instruction. So we study scripture so we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. And so we walk in the same paths of righteousness that are in the past. And we see God do his work within us. I say that again. Let's read verse 4 again. For whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction. Again, I'm reminding you again that those who first read this letter, this is referring to, to what we now call the Old Testament, so that we may have hope through endurance, through the encouragement of Scripture. Peter repeated this same theme in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. We also have this prophetic word. What, what is the prophetic word here? Mostly this is referring to Isaiah through Malachi. We have this prophetic word strongly confirmed. How is this word strongly confirmed? When in doubt, this is always the right answer, but it is absolutely the right answer here. Jesus, right? If you don't know how to answer a question at church, just say Jesus and you get it right. But this is clearer here. We have this prophetic word, Isaiah through Malachi, strongly confirmed. It's strongly confirmed through the witness of those who knew Jesus and now us who Jesus is alive in our hearts and his presence is with us and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Hey, aren't you guys glad that on this dark weekend with the stuff I talked about earlier, we had a place together, we had a service plan, Aubrey had the worship team ready. I have something to share with you today. The kids' ministry was ready. Communion is, 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 is ready to be distributed. We got a light shining in a dark place. Like this, is, this is a good thing today. Church is good today. I mean, there's a wholeness. There's a goodness. There's a purity. There's a holiness that pushes it back against the demonic work in this world. The work of evil. Guys, listen, evil is real. Evil is tangible. Evil is apparent. But light shines in darkness. And like, that there's something bright. This comes through the word of God. Pay attention to it. Pay attention to this lamp. Don't neglect Bible meditation. Don't neglect Bible reading. It's a light for you. It's not an obligation. You're not trying to earn your way to heaven. It's a light in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all. You know this, no prophecy of Scripture comes from the prophet's own interpretation. Because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Spirit. Men spoke from God. That's why I love reading a variety of things, because all wisdom comes from the Lord. And I think it's good to be a well-rounded um, educated, learned person. And, and that's not, that has nothing to do with degrees. That has everything to do with what you're reading now and what you're listening to now. But nothing compares to the anointing on Scripture. It does, it, it is different. It is different from any other source of wisdom because why? Because of what we just read. Because these words didn't come from a man himself. It was the Holy Spirit speaking to that person revealed to us. Here's the last observation today. And it, it has something to do with scripture. So we are bonded to other believers through the, the revelation and interpretation of scripture. And that leads me to my third point today. The third point from the passage, unite with other believers. Unite with other believers. How are we united? Are we united just by a collegial feelings? No, we're united through revealed scripture. And we're also united through the interpretation of scripture. And so it's like a funnel that, that at its biggest point is Jesus is the Messiah. And then what do we believe about scripture? 
And then it gets down to, to other things that will unite us that are secondary issues. So we're united with the Roman Catholic Church in Jesus, but when it comes to their view of Mary, we're not united. You see, that, that's where we separate. But on the, the broadest, broadest term, we're united through the scripture revealing Jesus as God. And this goes on and on with our other brothers and sisters throughout the world and throughout this region. And this is why the call to unity is important. The enemy, Satan, wants to divide the church. Satan wants to divide the church because he knows that when the church gets united on the non-negotiables, Jesus is God, revealed through Scripture. When we're united on that, then the world will change. That's when we are a shining light in darkness. Look at verse 5. Now may the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind, one voice. Therefore, welcome one another, just as Christ also welcomed you to the glory of God. I'm so glad for the cooperation that is happening in the kingdom of God right here in the North Nashville region. So glad here in Sumner County for the season of blessing. The season of blessing means that when we used to do what we call the Thanksgiving blessing, one church, one day, 100 turkeys, 150 some years. Now, season of blessing, multiple churches, multiple Saturdays, multiple seasons, both Thanksgiving and Christmas, it's a season of blessing. We do more together. When we are living out Romans 15, 5 through 7, we do more together. So we now have a tenfold. Last year we had 10 times as many meals given as we had ever done when we just did this by ourselves. All right? How many is your goal this year, you and your team? This year? The team, the body of Christ in North Nashville, Sumner County, we want to give out 2,000 meals together. From 120, 150, 2,000. Yeah, thank God for that. But here's what I want you to hear according to this scripture. It's not just a blending of programs and a blending of calendars. It's a blending of hearts. Under Jesus Christ, under the name of Jesus, the revealed Jesus who has a name, identity, and this Jesus has a very, very particular revelation. He's not Jesus the prophet, Jesus the teacher, Jesus the myth. He is Jesus the living God. So we give out turkey meals at Thanksgiving through the season of blessing and through Christmas in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus has been revealed to his church and through the scripture. And that's why we can live out that third point, unite with other believers. CIL Church, Christ is Love Church, we're not alone. We're not isolated. We are in partnership with God's work in this city and in this county. And as the years come on, as as the years advance, our church is going to grow. Our church is going to multiply. We're going to fill this land with the glory of God, these 17 acres he gave us. And we're going to do it not because we're better than other churches. It's because we are in harmony with other churches and we are connected. And there is an anointing that comes when people are in, in unity. And there's a blessing and anointing that comes. I want to invite our ushers to begin to prepare to distribute communion. Because today, we're going to take communion as one. As one body here in this room. If you're watching online, you could get your own elements. If, 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 you, have, if you can do that, go ahead and do that right now. Because you're part of the body of Christ too. Those here in this room, we are one. And we are one with churches in Israel that took communion earlier today. Maybe some are taking it tonight for a night service. We're at one with gatherings of churches even in places like Gaza and the West Bank. We are one with house churches in Iran. We are one with 
the underground church in China. We are one with the revival-centered churches of South America. We are, we are one with the churches of Africa. And we are one with the churches that will cause a traffic jam for you on the way home. They're not our enemies. They're our brothers and sisters. We are one. And when we take the Lord's Supper, we're reminded of that. One body, one bread, one cup. This is what occurs. And I want to share with you a scripture that changed my life, a scripture that I received right here in this room. I was at a Monday, Thursday service. And I'll have to look back. I think the year was 2019, but it, that doesn't matter. As Pastor Deborah was leading that service, she led us to meditate on the scripture. And, it, and it's changed my life. I pray it every day now. John 13, 34. I give you a new command. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Guys, I took this passage in Romans 15. It was just seven verses, but I gave you three reminders today. I, rem I reminded you to build others up. I reminded you to let the scriptures form you. I reminded you to unite with other believers. Guys, our brothers and sisters 2,000 years ago in this cosmopolitan city that's not, not much different than Nashville in many ways, we're called to do these things. And so we are called to do these things. What's going to happen is this. I'm going to pray, um, pray over the elements, and then they'll be passed your way. Hold those if you choose to. And I'll be back in a few minutes to lead us. No one is obligated to take communion. If you just don't want to today, that's fine. Sometimes Christians choose not to. But everyone is welcome. You don't have to be a member of this church. And you certainly don't have to be perfect. Because if that was the case, I wouldn't be qualified to preach today. But we'll all, we'll all ask for Christ's forgiveness before we take communion. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you now in the name of Jesus. We dedicate these elements to you the symbol of the bread, the symbol of the cup. Lord, we know there's symbols, but Lord, within that symbol, there's power. Lord, as Pastor Aubrey ministers to us, Lord, let us reflect upon our own life. Let us be quick to repent sin, repent of sin, and let us follow the truths out of Romans 15 that we're given this day. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. search the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise the pleasures of fear are never enough but then you came along and put me back together Is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better. My failures and flaws, oh, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. And the God of the mountain is the God of the valley, and there's not a place your mercy won't find me. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing.
Isn't that what our God has done? He's done for us what we cannot do for ourselves. I, I want to repeat something Pastor Faith said last week when she, she led us into communion. And it was so brilliant and so from the Lord. And, and that's why I repeat it today. She said, you know, the bread you hold in your hand, the cup you hold in your hand, it's not an obstacle to God. It's an invitation from God. Um, sometimes we think, oh, I'm not worthy of this. That's why we need Jesus. We're never good enough, perfect enough, disciplined enough. But the desire to connect with the presence of God and even the conviction of sin is a sign of God's work in our lives. I thought, and I'm summarizing what I heard her say, but I wanted you to hear that same sentiment this morning. So we are people who confess our sins. We are people who repent. We are people who turn from our sins and turn to God through the work of Jesus. We are a church that believes the Trinity. So there's a prayer we'll pray this day. It calls upon Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right in the middle of that prayer, it says, Jesus, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. When I say those words, I'm trusting God's forgiveness completely. And I'm confessing my sin to him and knowing that only Jesus can forgive me. I'm going to pray this now. I want to invite you to join me. I'm praying it for myself, but would you pray it for yourself also? Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, set up your kingdom in our midst. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Holy Spirit, breath of the living God, renew me and all of the world. The bread you have in your hand represents the body of Christ that was broken for you as we remember his death, celebrate his resurrection, and proclaim Christ is coming again. Let us eat the bread together. The cup you hold in your hand represents the blood of Jesus as we remember his death, celebrate his resurrection, and proclaim Christ is coming again. Let us drink the cup together. Thanks be to God. If you're able to stand, let's stand for the benediction. I want to invite Pastor Mauricio and Pastor Deborah positioning themselves to other prayer partners if you want to come and are able to join them. So prayer partners, you can come, come forward. So as we dismiss, if you have a prayer need, anything in your life, Pastor Deborah's here to your right, to your left, Tate, Mauricio will be here. We just want to pray with you. We want to encourage you. Uh, we want you to know that your need matters. You aren't just filling a seat. You're a gift from God to us. And so whatever you may have need of, we want to pray with you. We do receive this blessing as we depart. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his countenance towards you and give you peace. I love you. Jesus loves you. Have a great week in him.